Welcome all to the second lunch lecture of the Students for Sustainability Week. Uh, before I introduce the speaker, I want to say that Students for Sustainability is looking for new part-time board members. So if you want to do more with sustainability, uh, this is your chance. And if you have questions, uh, you can ask them uh, to those in the front. Um, now, quickly back to the lecture. Dusan um, Dupu, we are glad that you uh, want to speak and uh, we are curious about what you want to say. Yes? That was a good uh, introduction. <laughs> Well, of course, uh, of course, I want to speak because uh, uh, every opportunity we get to share our ideas about sustainability is a welcome opportunity, and especially with uh, young people who are representing the future, actually, of our profession. Um, uh, I was asked to talk about the Dutch wind wheel, which I will do, but uh, I think it's important to, to share some uh, more projects uh, of ours with you so that you have a better understanding of the context, how we operate as architects and how we position ourselves within the field of sustainability. Um, great that it's in English, because I'm actually an English native speaker. Um, I emigrated to the Netherlands in the 90s to work for MVRDV Architects, a great, uh, a great office, a great Rotterdam office. Uh, I fell in love with Dutch architecture, and um, since 2007 I've been working with Helene Strijkers. Uh, Dupel Strijkers is the name of our office. And, um, one of the things that really intrigues me about uh, sustainability uh, in South Africa, where I was educated, um, is that uh, we always say uh, architecture and urban design should contribute somehow um, to a circular and an inclusive economy. And that's quite an interesting um, statement, because if you start thinking about circular, then as designers and engineers, it's quite easy to come up with kind of strategies. How can we close material cycles? water, energy, food, waste, um, and how can we c connect those strategies to new uh, uh, value or business cases. But uh, for me, the clue sits more in the, in the other word, inclusive. Um, so how can we create uh, uh, strategies that contribute both to a circular and an inclusive economy? And when I talk about inclusive uh, economy, then um, you can translate that in many different ways. You could talk about a participation process in South Africa. For example, when you design an urban plan or a building, it's impossible to even conceive doing that without the end users in picture. So co-creation, participation planning, those are, are terms which are everyday and also terms which we use in our everyday practice now in the Netherlands. Uh, there are a lot of offices who are doing very good work, often more from, from, from art, uh, in terms of participation and participation planning in the Netherlands. Another aspect about participation planning or um, the inclusive aspect of, uh, of design is can we come up with strategies that um, contribute to job uh, creation, empowerment of people, or education? So take that, uh, bear that in mind as I go through some of our, our, our projects to give you an idea of how we do that in our work. Most of the work we do, oh, it's very washed out. This should be bright orange, not, um, not this kind of shitty brown. Uh, <laughs> um, it's a great beamer. Um, most of our work is actually focusing on the existing urban fabric. Um, we all know that we, um, we, we demolish roughly 2% 2, 2 of the urban stock per year and we build that new. So the biggest challenge is not new buildings. The biggest challenge is how to deal with the existing urban fabric. And resource efficient design is a strategy that we apply in all of our projects. Uh, it's a design philosophy based on, um, well, it, the title says it all, resource efficiency. Um, and one of the first things you can do is, um, before you start thinking about demolishing a building, start thinking about how can you give it a second life. So most, most of our projects, uh, we're very critical um, also towards clients who come with a question, how, how can we actually give, uh, uh, reuse the existing structures? An example here, park site, an old ambulance garage that we converted into an urban villa, or a temporary project, uh, an old city hall in Valveik that we, co we converted into a temporary uh, museum and education facility. And what's interesting about this project, the reason I show it is because it started off as a, a temporary strategy uh, with a very low budget. Um, and what's happened now is that it's, um, it's become um, Im 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 embedded in the local culture. People in Valveik uh, love the project, 
and we're going to expand it now to a permanent uh, shoe, museum, uh, uh, shoe museum and education facility. So sometimes uh, a temporary strategy can be used to create something more permanent. Um, perhaps one of the projects in the Netherlands that in any case uh, touches best on this circular and inclusive design approach is the Haka Recycle Office, an old uh, building in the, the Merve Vierhavens in Rotterdam, a uh, very um, robust uh, structure. And we were asked to come up with a strategy for uh, uh, an interior for um, the Cleantech Delta. And what we did here was we um, connected uh, a number of demolition projects in the region of Rotterdam. We looked at what kind of um, demolition materials are coming out of the region. And we built an interior of 1,000 uh, square meters using uh, these demolition flows. What interesting, what's, what's really interesting about this project is that um, if you look at uh, our most ambitious projects uh, in the Netherlands, but also in Rotterdam, in terms of inclusion, we have a, a, a normally a 5% uh, social return on investment uh, paragraph. And that means that 5% uh, of the people who work on the project um, should somehow be um, in a training process or have some kind of a distance to the labor market. And what's interesting about this project that we actually had, instead of 5%, we had 80% social return on investment. We built the whole interior using uh, ex-convicts uh, in a reintegration pro program. And that was really fascinating um, for us as architects because when you're designing and building an interior or a building um, with people who are unskilled, you have to adjust your approach and your design for the people who are doing the implementation. So there's a direct relationship between design, resource efficient design, and inclusive design if you're going to realize projects on, in, in this fashion. One of the um, structures that or, or, or philosophies that we use in most of our projects when we talk about circularity and circular inclusion is this diagram by Stuart Brand. It was uh, already made in the 90s where um, he already was thinking about how can we uh, construct buildings which contribute to a circular economy. And what he did was he separated the different layers of the building out. Uh, each layer of the building has its own life cycle. I'm sure all of you are familiar with life cycle analysis and end of life, uh, second lives and, second, and usage after end of life. What he did is he, he said, okay, there are a number of layers. Uh, the site that's permanent, well, permanent as permanent as the world is, let's say. Uh, you have the structure. Uh, the basic construction uh, that can last up to 200 years. Now, we have examples which are much older in the Netherlands. Mostly we aim for about 50 years when we design, but we can make structures which, which go a lot longer. We have the skin or the facade of the building, which goes for about 30, 35 years. Then you have to start thinking about renewing, maintenance, the services or the installations, 15 to 20 years. And then you have uh, the space plan or the interior and the stuff. And uh, the stuff... Uh, if you look at our consumerist uh, society, that really gets replaced very often. And then I'm talking about tables and chairs. And what's interesting is you, if you look at the cycle of replacement and the CO2 footprints uh, that are associated with those cycles of replacement, it's immense. So what's really smart about this approach is if you design and build in this fashion, you separate out all the different layers of the building and you ensure that uh, the elements can be replaced on different scales as, as, as element or component or as, as raw material, um, whereby you can ensure that they also get fed back in to the cycle, the material cycle. A small project that we're doing um, in Rotterdam on, in Highplatz uh, at the RDM uh, campus uh, in Concept House Village is an active reuse house uh, developed together also with uh, Dick van Velen, who incidentally invited me for uh, this, uh, this lecture. What's an interesting uh, idea about the, the reuse house is that we um, basically posed ourselves the question, um, is it possible to construct uh, a sustainable house um, for uh, a family or for starters in the market that's completely constructed using secondary materials? So what we do is we see the city, the existing city, as a, a resource bank. You've all heard the term urban mining, I think. We mine the city for resources, so we're building with our local resources. But we build using the principles that I just demonstrated in brand. So we separate all the layers of the building. We, we only work with dry connections. Uh, we, are, we work only with homogenous materials. 
And by building in that way, we can ensure that at the end of the life cycle of components, materials, or elements, that they come back into, uh, into the cycle, which means you can also go to new patterns of ownership. Uh, when you start designing and building in this fashion, you can start thinking about product service systems. Uh, I'm sure some of you are familiar with, uh, well, in product design, it's actually quite, uh, quite, quite old, but uh, even trainers, uh, you can actually start renting things instead of buying them. Basically, that's the principle. So uh, Philips has, has developed a light uh, fitting. They say, okay, it's not interesting to, the, the armature itself is not interested, interesting. What you want is the light. So you, you, you pay a monthly fee for light, and um, you always ensure it of the best armature. So they come in and change it. Uh, so it's a different way of thinking about uh, the, the, the way in which we uh, build, but also a building could be a kind of, um, let's say, a, it's, it's a number of services that we bring together. So lights, fresh air, heat, etc., etc., etc. And when you defragment the building uh, in this way, you can come up with completely new business models which go far beyond just the, the building phase. It goes right into the operations phase. So you get a, a very different financial model for, um, for building and for design. And basically what we did was we developed a, a, a concept uh, wherein flexibility, flexibility and adaptib, uh, adaptability excuse me, are um, the prime concern. So you have a basic model. As a starter, you can uh, buy this house and basically the only thing you have is a staircase and a bathroom and two floors, but as your family grows, you can add walls, you can uh, add a, a level on the upside, you can take uh, the facade off and you can add out to the outside. So it's, a, it's a basically it's a flexible building uh, system uh, which ties into the principle of uh, your changing lifestyle uh, and also uh, ties strongly into the principle of circular economy. Another small prototype that we're developing, also on Hyplite, uh, coincidentally, is what we call a bio-based uh, retrofit uh, project. And when I talk about materials and our, our, our material use, we have um, a very simple principle. We always say, first, reuse. So when you're designing, can we use secondary materials? And if we can't use secondary materials, bio-based. And bio-based, I'm sure all of you know what that is. It's renewable materials. And what we do here is quite interesting. Um, it's a project that ties into the whole um, uh, the, the energy sprung. Uh, you're all familiar with European legislation that uh, stipulates that all new building should be energy neutral by 2020 and all existing stock, and this is an existing stock, has to be energy neutral by 2050. And this is a huge challenge. How are we going to retrofit, let's say, energy pimp our buildings uh, to make them energy neutral in a sustainable way by 2050. And the current business case is based on um, making the building energy neutral in one go, and then the saved energy costs um, are used to pay for the retrofit. Um, but what you see is that the saved energy costs over, over roughly 20, 20 years uh, um, represents an amount of roughly 35 to 40,000 uh, euros. And if you look at the, 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 the costs for retrofitting your building, you're looking at about 60 to 70,000 euros. So there's a, a, there's a, a kind of a, a gap between what it costs to renovate and what the benefits are in 20 years. And depending on the client, if it's a corporation, maybe this is foreseeable, but for private homeowners, this is a, an investment that most will, won't make. And what we try to do in this uh, project is to actually connect the idea of circular and inclusive to the total process. So we, we, we zoom out and look at the total building process from a distance. And actually with renewable materials, you also have a, a phase before where the materials are being grown. Uh, and what we uh, proposed to do here was to connect the, the growth of the, the production of hemp, industrial hemp, uh, to the, the total cycle of the building. So. Um, Industrial hemp has an interesting characteristic, and that is that it uh, remediates polluted soil. In the Rotterdam uh, City Harbor area, we have a lot of polluted soil. And if you take one hectare of polluted soil uh, and you remediate it uh, using hemp, that's a natural uh, process, uh, it, it represents basically a, a saving of roughly 175,000 euros per hectare 
compared to traditional remediation, which is actually just putting an extra layer of, of soil on top of the existing building site. So at the moment that we would be, we'd be able to, one, produce hemp locally, and two, remediate soil, it could become conceivable that we uh, use a part of the saved uh, remediation costs for the energy retrofit. So basically, the, the reason I'm showing you this project is that it hasn't been re realized, and there's a reason that it hasn't been realized. Uh, it's a complex process because the, the long-term term beneficiaries of the investment are not interested in the short-term investment. Um, so matching ambitions is also part of the game. But uh, zooming out and looking at a business case or value case from a distance and trying to make new connections is a strategy which can lead to quite surprising uh, um, uh, constructions, but also will influence the way in which you design and think, uh, think about design. Some of the work we do uh, is pretty uh, far removed, you could, you could say, from uh, the projects that I've just shown you. For example, the, we've just developed a new store for the KPN, which is uh, the large telecom uh, provider in the Netherlands. The reason I show you this is because we do a lot of retail, and in retail, uh, one of the things that we see happening more and more is the introduction of smart technology. Uh, we're all walking, I don't know where mine is, but we all walk around with a mobile phone, um, and that means that our, we have an interface, a mobile interface, with us at all times. And what we do in this shop, for example, is we, um, besides the design, which is a completely new typology, let's say, for these kinds of shops, we integrated a, a smart wall. The whole wall of the, the shop is a smart wall. And most of the people who enter these shops are actually already clients of KPN. So they have a user profile. And when you enter the shop, the shop recognizes that you're there because your telephone has entered the shop. And an avatar appears on the wall. And the avatar walks through the shop with you. And you can touch the avatar. And uh, your uh, contract, your current contract, appears on the screen. Uh, you get information. Now your contract is finished in uh, two months. So then you can pick out a new phone. And for the same price, it could be so. It's this one and this one. This one. And the reason I'm, I'm telling you this is because this technology is already there. And we're, we're finding new ways how to use it to inform our design process and integrate it in our design process. And it may seem quite far removed, but um, some of you may know Het Dorp in Arnhem, uh, very famous uh, in, the, in the 60s and 70s. Uh, Miss Baumann was a, a TV presenter. She's still alive, by the way. Um, and it was the first crowdfunding project in the Netherlands. For 24 hours, there was a, an online on TV. There was like a crowdfunding action, and Het Dorp is a is a is a, a village for 400 handicapped people. And in that time, uh, you have to rem remember it's 50 years ago. Eh? In that time, uh, it was a very very disruptive solution. Uh, it was completely breaking with traditions in in relation to healthcare, and. Um, Basically, through this crowdfunding action, Hedorp was built, and it functioned perfectly for the last 50 years. But now, uh, a lot has changed. The, the, the societal context has changed, the healthcare system has changed, the funding for healthcare has changed. And we won a competition um, to develop a new disruptive solution for Hedorp, uh, based on architecture uh, and urban redesign, because it's a transformation process. And one of the, the key uh, aspects of this approach is uh, user-centered de centered design. So we have uh, people with a, with a handicap in our design team working with us. Uh, we also, the whole design team spent 24 hours in a drop, in a, in, in a wheelchair, experiencing what it is to, 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 to have a handicap. But the interesting thing is that it's about the role technology can play in empowering these people. You have to imagine uh, a lot of the people in a dorp are um, people who were functioning like you and I. They have a car accident. The next day they're in hospital and they're lamed, or their brain is working not as well as it used to. And they have to learn to uh, deal with this handicap. A lot of them are mentally super sharp, uh, just like you or I. Uh, the only thing is their body limits them in what they can do. And they can move their hand. 
And there are people there who can um, uh, make, uh, do computer programming using a little dot on their foreheads. So technology um, is incredibly important for this group of people. And what we do in Adorb is we try to integrate technology in architecture and in an environment to create what we call a, a predictive, healthy, healing environment. And the interesting thing about that is that um, through new technology, uh, technology on your body, in your clothing, in your apartment, in your building, in your context, we can start to uh, determine patterns, pattern recognition. So uh, pattern recognition makes it possible to optimize uh, the use of buildings and space. It happens in sport already. Uh, we, we already can real-time track how often a ball, somebody has a ball, how much, uh, what their movement is when, they, uh, when they're playing so they can optimize their games. So the technology is there. And um, how can we incorporate that technology in the built environment to come up with more sustainable ecosystems? So we're working on the final design at the moment, and we will start building uh, after the summer. Uh, for us, a very, very exciting uh, project. And one of the key things that we do is uh, through building uh, information modeling, BIM. Most of you know what that is. Hopefully, all, you, all of you are learning to do that, because if you can't, you won't have a job in the future. But um, we make an interesting link between BIM, uh, our BIM models and uh, the maintenance and op the operating phase of the building. So through uh, BIM, uh, through uh, interfaces, new user interfaces, it's possible with your iPad to walk through the building. You can measure the temperature, the air, uh, humidity, uh, you can measure practically everything in the building and track the, the patterns. So, for example, um, we know which client of ours is in a certain apartment. We know what the temperature has been for the last year. We know what the air humidity is for the last year. And we know what their health uh, has been for the last year. So you can start to make a link between spatial design and health. And at the moment that you can do that, you can start to think about new value cases or new business cases. Because if you can create a healing environment where you actually, through smart design, uh, see an improvement in health, you can start thinking about how can we finance that space because it's contributing to a positive uh, uh, health. Uh, one more project and then I'll get to the Dutch wind wheel. Um, a lot of these concepts uh, come together in a project we're doing uh, for the Almeida, for the Floriada. In 2022, we will have a World Expo in the Netherlands, uh, in the Floriada. And um, it's a design uh, by MVRDV, a huge kind of uh, carpet, which will, it's immense, it's like 50 hectares. And uh, it will be designed um, using the, the, the themes, feeding, healthing, energizing, and greening the city. And the idea is that it's an expo for six months, and after that, it will be turned into a, 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 the, the most green, healthy neighborhood of the Netherlands. That's the idea. Um, we have a client, which is the province of uh, Flevoland, and they asked us to come up with a pavilion that we can build this year already, um, six years before the expo, so that we can start uh, to create uh, uh, innovations together with students, uh, businesses, and research institutes around these topics. Uh, what was interesting is we have a client uh, 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 who will use the space, and that's the CAHA, the, the Christian Agrarian uh, Agricultural High School. So yeah, yeah. it's not, not, not one, I don't know what it really is in English. But, and with them, to, uh, together with them, we said, well, we also want to raise the, the, the ambition a bit. Um, so what we tried to do is to build a pavilion which is nature-based. And that's super interesting from a design point of view. I'll get back on that. But um, nature-based and also circular. So um, how, does a, how does a pavilion on the Floriada relate to the circular economy? What's also essential is that uh, in any World Expo, you know that the, the pavilion, the buildings, they also have to have a certain kind of narrative. Storytelling is really important in our business. Um, how to how create a design or a, a space 
that has a narrative that uh, somehow touches your own ambitions, but also touches the ambitions of the user and the client. Um, because through narratives, you create ownership. And one of the things that we try to do for the, the expo in uh, uh, Almere is create a narrative that um, tells the story of Flevoland. I'm not sure how many foreigners there are in the audience here. I'm not sure how familiar you are with the Netherlands. But Flevoland is a, is a polder in the sort of in the middle of uh, the Netherlands, a bit above Amsterdam. And uh, it's the one of the largest polders in, in the Netherlands. It's one of the, the youngest polder. Uh, but it has a very innovative uh, DNA. It's very innovative in terms of water management, energy production, and food production. And it used to be the bottom of the sea. I mean, it's really weird for foreigners to think about uh, you know, growing fruit and vegetables on the bottom of the sea, five, five meters below the sea level. And what we did for this uh, pavilion is we uh, came up with a, a concept uh, where we take a huge piece of this fertile ground, 20 by 20 meters, five meters high, and we lift it up to the level of the sea, to the NIP, uh, NIP line, which is uh, this line underneath the building. So what you see is a, a reflective mirror facade, uh, which is on NIP sea level, and above that you have this fertile ground. <laughs> And um, that's uh, uh, quite a, a challenge, uh, but uh, I'll, get, I'll get onto that in a sec. What we do in that uh, lifted up ground is we have um, all kinds of different uh, spaces where um, students and businesses can innovate. They can do experiments with um, uh, plants, cultivating plants in different conditions. And uh, underneath, the layer underneath is a very transparent layer where um, you can work and have presentations, etc. So it's a kind of a, a mixed-use building um, that tells a story of Flevoland, but also is completely nature-based. So our use of materials are, are nature-based. And what we do is we try to uh, close as many cycles as possible. Uh, we call it a climate architecture. We try to design with the microclimate. Um, so using uh, passive systems for, for cooling, for heating, uh, for ventilation, et cetera, et cetera. So a very low-tech approach combined with a very high-tech approach and in a didactic way. So we make it visible. And also a main challenge is how to create an, uh, an improved uh, biodiversity uh, for, this, uh, for this project. One of the things we have to do is integrate a, a, a hotel for bats. And I mean, that's really nice. We really got this in the program of uses, integrate a hotel for bats. I mean, it's great when the client asks you to do that. Um, we don't only limit it to ourselves to the design of the building. We also think about the, the area around it. Uh, we have a, a boulevard next to the, to the building, and we will use that as a solar boulevard to generate uh, sustainable energy. So the building will develop this year, and towards 2020, it will become more and more energy neutral. So it's a process, uh, and we show that, how we're going to make the step to energy neutrality in 2020. And one of the aspects is to integrate a smart uh, watering system. We want to create a kind of uh, a bank of water vapor around the building. And what we think would be really beautiful is if we can do it once a day, when it's high tide, uh, we water the, 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 the trees. And that mist bank, let's say, goes up to the sea level uh, height. So there's a, a relationship between the tide and the uh, sea level. Uh, uh, and what's nice about this, every day it's at a different moment. So you have to be quite sharp if you want to be there at the right moment. You have to check when is it high tide. And this will uh, generate a, quite a beautiful image from uh, seen from uh, Almira. It's really poor quality beam of this because this is really quite a nice image. What we do is we pull the two levels apart. The upper level is uh, made from earth. And this is really interesting because we have a certain kind of experimental status in this project. Um, we really want to build as much as possible with real air earth, obviously. And it has to be the profile, the earth profile of Flevoland. So we're working together with the TU Delft to look at in how far we can make um, geopolymers. How can we build a, a safe structure with as little cement as possible um, and also use um, uh, replace cement with other materials. So we have a building which is broken up into different uh, constructive elements where we can do different forms of experimentation in relation to uh, 
cement poor uh, building or building without cement. An image from uh, above, this is a beautiful tribune which you really can't see, um, made out of earth, so we literally carve out the spaces and an image of how it is to be on the roof. Um, to finish off, uh, I'd like to tell you something about the Dutch wind wheel. Um, I'm not sure if this film is going to work, but let's do our best. The Netherlands is known for its windmills. Around 1,200 of them, some dating back centuries ago, are continuing to stand across the country. Now the port city of Rotterdam is trying something new. It plans to introduce a high-tech windmill-shaped skyscraper. Find out more. A unique landmark. La patria dei mulini a vento potrebbe presto ospitare wind wheel. Im Land der Windmühlen könnte schon bald das Windwheel gebaut werden. Pour leur moulin avant, mais à l'avenir, ils le seront peut-être pour leur roue avant. Windwheel. An unprecedented attraction. La struttura alta 174 metri è progettata per essere circondata da due anelli. Ein Gebäude, das die Winde in der niederländischen Hafenstadt Rotterdam dazu nutzt, sich selbst ohne externen Input mit Energie zu versorgen. A sustainable icon. C'est un système d'énergie renouvelable mis à l'essai dans le port de Rotterdam. Uno esterno rotante e uno interno statico contenente alcuni appartamenti, un hotel e un ristorante. The Dutch wind wheel. This is not a building. Um, this is a very interesting project for us. Uh, I think about 90%, 80-90% of our projects are commissioned projects, so we have a client who comes to us with a question. Um, that's pretty much how it goes for most architects, I think. But every once in a while we have an idea and we don't have a client, and uh, we will never find a client which, who would pose the question to which this would be the answer. So this is a project uh, developed on our own initiative with uh, par two partners, uh, Johan Melleges, which is the director, interim director of uh, Kinderdijk, and uh, Block, who are quite innovative in process management. And basically the Dutch Windwheel is a project that uh, plays into um, a, a changing landscape. If you look at the Rotterdam as a city, Rotterdam has uh, in the last 10 years evolved in incredibly as a touristic destination. I think maybe the fact that it's been taken up in the Lonely Planet uh, this year as one of the top uh, five destinations um, is, 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 is a kind of uh, proof of that. So there's a growing uh, amount of tourism uh, to Rotterdam. And at the same time, Rotterdam is really battling with um, uh, the status as a harbor city with a, with a, a linear fossil economy. Uh, and wanting to make the transition to uh, the next economy, which is a circular clean technology economy. And um, the Dutch windmill plays actually in, into this kind of uh, landscape. Uh, what is it actually? It's a, it's a combination of two things. On the one hand, it's a combination of a touristic attraction. Uh, I mean, think of the London Eye, but then in a completely new form. Uh, and it's a combination of uh, retail. So it, it consists of two rings. The outer ring is the touristic attractions, 30 cabins where, that can carry 40 people moving under the water up to the top of the building and then down on the other side. And the inner ring is a retail ring with a hotel, sky lobby, sky bar, uh, apartments and, uh, and retail. And the two rings uh, kiss at the top, which is kind of constructively smart. Uh, but it also offers an opportunity to go from the one ring to the other. So we separate out the two flows of, uh, of, 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 of residents and also uh, tourists, uh, but we also bring them together in the top. Uh, incredibly um, intricate and complex uh, uh, accessibility. Uh, the interesting thing about a project like this is that um, once you conceive it, uh, we're gonna, uh, let's say we're gonna make a, uh, a, a, a wind wheel or a, a London eye, a Ferris wheel in a form that's uh, never been, been seen and combine it with a, a windmill of a future, because that's actually what we do, the inner, the inner ring is a windmill. Then you start to get called from all over the world with innovative companies who have solutions to solve the problem because they identify their own ambitions in your project. 
So what have we done? We've actually created a narrative, a story that um, is about uh, the future that a lot of top companies in the world uh, can relate to and want to work with us on. It's approximately 60,000 square meters to give you an, uh, an indication. It's 174 meters high, uh, 235 meters wide. Um, and the biggest challenge we actually had here was um, if you look at uh, the problems that the Earth is facing, one of the biggest challenges is, is mass urbanization. We know that our cities are growing incredibly. At the same time, um, we have uh, huge challenges regarding energy, water, and food. And what the Dutch wind wheel tries to do is come up with a typology or a possible uh, scenario, solution, for uh, two of these challenges, uh, energy and water. So how can we create a, a dense, high-rise building in an urban context that uh, generates more energy than it consumes? And with small buildings, it's not really such a challenge because a small building has a relatively small surface area in relation to the facade. So you can generate your own energy. But when we start getting into skyscrapers, it becomes a massive, massive challenge. So our strategy is um, to, uh, to, to have a, a, a hybrid uh, energy system. Um, and that's based on, obviously, uh, all of the elements. So solar energy, um, we have 30,000 square meters of uh, PV uh, integrated uh, into the facade optimally facing the sun. In the middle, we have um, a, a windmill. Uh, it's not a windmill like most of you know with a turbine. It's a technology developed by the TU Delft. They are also a partner in our project um, called the Avicon. And basically, it's a windmill without moving parts. So what you see in the middle of these tubes, there's water moving through these uh, tubes. And on scale, I mean, these are huge. Uh, <laughs> Oops, tubes, uh, there's water moving through with a, with a positive charge. Around the edge, there's water that gets sprayed also with the charge, and the wind moves the sprayed water away from this field, and this generates energy which can be tapped off. This technology has been proven in a small scale, and part of our project um, is, uh, and that's what we're currently doing in 2016, is we're building an innovation uh, uh, coalition and uh, part of the challenge is to upscale this technology as one of the innovations of the project. Uh, we also have biogas, biogas uh, production. Uh, uh, so it's a, it's a hybrid uh, system, and the, the first estimates are that this building will produce more than it consumes, which is, in a way, it will be a world uh, premiere if we manage to pull this off. It's obviously also about water. Um, our partners, uh, for example, are on energy uh, Eneco, uh, ECN, TNO, Siemens, they're all partners of the project, uh, but also SPI, Huawei, uh, and for, for water, Deltares and Efides. Uh, we have a coalition of 15 partners. And with water, what's interesting is not only looking at how can we close the water cycle in a, in a system that uh, works in a Dutch context, but also how can we solve some of the challenges that we have in other cities, cities that are much drier, where water is not as abundant as it is in, in a Dutch context. An interesting aspect um, is, again, the, the ecosystem. Uh, how can we create a, a building which um, is a smart, predictive ecosystem and which is tailored to the different users? So on the one hand, you have the people who are living there. Uh, Head Dorp was an example of how we can create an, a healthy ecosystem where we link um, predictive uh, mapping to optimization of use and experience. Here it's also, again, you have the, the, the different users, the people living in the building, working in the building, but also the tourists. And one of the things that um, we're working on is the ultimate cus customer journey. Um, your journey uh, begins when you start booking your trip. So you book your trip in, let's say, China. You don't book a trip to Holland, you book a trip to Europe. And you go to London, Amsterdam. In the past, you went to Kinderdijk and then through to Brussels and Antwerpen. Now you will go to Kinderdijk and then by boat to Rotterdam to the wind wheel. And then hopefully the one and a half million expected uh, visitors will also shop in the inner city of Rotterdam, which will generate about 100 million euros per year uh, in indirect uh, benefits to the city. And what, what, we, what we do is we, we uh, connect the customer journey to the end experience. So your journey begins when you book 
Uh, maybe you get asked, uh, who are you traveling with? Maybe you get asked, what is your favorite song? A little bit of extra information. When you enter the wind wheel, the building knows you're there. Uh, you get into the cabin, you go underwater, you get this wonderful story about Dutch innovation and water management. And as you go up, uh, the smart walls, transparent glass, they can see what you're seeing. They can estimate what you're seeing in the distance and information starts to uh, come up on the, on the walls in your language, telling you a layer of information about a church, perhaps, in the distance. Two minutes later, your favorite song starts playing. And you, start, you get a good feeling, but you don't really make the connection. Oh, yeah, six months ago when I was booking my trip, I said I love, uh, uh, well, Ebba. <laughs> the next moment, uh, a message appears on the screen. Your friends, Bob, uh, Bob and Harry, are in the cocktail bar, and they've ordered uh, uh, oysters and champagne at table 74. So this is just a small example, but uh, basically... The customer journey and the user experience is becoming more and more uh, an, an active part of the way in which we design and think about uh, space. Here an impression of the, the sky lobby. I think David Beckham is already walking around somewhere there. At night, obviously, if it's wind still, we have the opportunity to do something spectacular in this uh, vapor of water. So we can do projections uh, uh, every once in a while, maybe for King's Day what used to be Queen's Day. And in terms of location, we have two uh, locations that we are looking at. The one is at the, the end of the, the Euromas Park in Rotterdam, which is quite a nice one because it's as close proximity to the cultural precinct. Uh, the other one is in the Merve Fee Havens. Uh, this is an impression, what you see uh, how in scale, how it would fit uh, in the park uh, environment. And what some of you may know is that Rotterdam is busy uh, working on an, a bid for the World Expo in 2025. It's not sure if they're really going to, if, if Holland is really going to do the bid, but it will become sure in the next months. And if, if we do win the bid, then the Merve Vierhavens, which was the second site, will become the, let's say, the development area for the World Expo. And uh, this could also be a fantastic place uh, to realize uh, the Dutch wind wheel. So we don't really link the two projects to each other yet, but if you ask uh, Leonard Bickert, who is the director of the World Expo 2025, Rotterdam bid, uh, what will be the tour de fil for Rotterdam 2025, then he says, without a doubt, the Dutch windmill. Thank you very much. <laughs>